I'm Beverly Mills. I represent the Sauerland Conservancy. I'm a volunteer trustee, and I'd like to welcome you tonight to this presentation by Tyler Christensen on the topic of bird migration. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we have a lot of people on this call. Our meeting technical host, Maya, from our terrific Sauerland Conservancy staff is here. She's our tech host, and she has your audio muted while we all listen to the talk so there won't be any distractions. Uh, I believe you're all free to turn on and off your own video, however. Also on our screen tonight is the Executive Director of the Sauerland Conservancy, Lori Cleveland, uh, and we'll hear from her a little bit more when the program is over. Our speaker, Tyler, will be presenting slides and materials for 45 minutes or to an hour. After that, we'll have a question and answer period. So at that time, just wave your hand or type something in the chat bar, and we will get that organized and have a good, robust discussion at the end. Um, finally, this talk is being recorded so that we may offer it to you and to others on our website. So please go ahead and uh, recommend it to your friends. Now I'd like to introduce our wonderful speaker, Tyler Christensen. Tyler is an ornithologist, ecologist, and environmental educator from right here in Hopewell, New Jersey. He's a PhD student in the Maslow Lab at Rutgers University, studying patterns of resource selection and migration in threatened birds of prey that rely on grasslands, young forests, and other disturbance-dependent habitat. He is the co-founder and executive director of the Wild Bird Research Group, a nonprofit organization conducting conservation-oriented research on wild bird populations from New Jersey all the way to the Neotropics. You can learn more about that organization at wildbirdresearch.org. So, Tyler, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Beverly. Um, thank you for that introduction. And uh, I'm always honored when I'm asked to do a talk for the Sauerland Conservancy. I was uh, joking earlier that I'm always surprised when they call me back, um, but I'm especially honored to be giving this one on, on Earth Day. Um, and tonight, um, I'll be talking to you about a very timely topic, our migratory birds and the research and conservation efforts that uh, are being conducted to understand and protect them. Okay, so I've arranged this uh, program into three parts. Um, the first part is a primer on neotropical migrants where I'll be talking a bit about the players and the amazing natural phenomenon and, and survival strategy that is bird migration. Um, and then a very brief overview of the research that we do here in the Sourlands as well as in the neotropics where many of these species um, spend their winters. Um, and then finally, um, an overview on the Migratory Bird Treater Treaty Act, which was uh, um, the flagship migratory bird conservation legislation in the Americas. Um, and um, part of that section will, will be about steps that were taken by the previous presidential administration to weaken that act and then where that act stands right now, because um, this is critically important for conservation of our uh, migratory birds, which are um, very important to us all. So I'm the executive director of the Wild Bird Research Group, as Beverly mentioned, and a PhD student in um, ecology and evolution at Rutgers. I'm uh, also um, an ecological consultant um, for my company, Piedmont Ecological Services. So that's a little about me and that's me holding a, uh, a baby American kestrel, which is uh, one of the species that I have the privilege of, of working with. Uh, Wild Bird Research Group was officially founded in 2017, but it brought together several <clears throat> research projects that had been going on since around 2011, um, and it brought those projects together under a single roof. Um, we're based in New Jersey, but we have project areas in North Carolina and in Costa Rica, um, and we're interested broadly in, in population monitoring, um, community dynamics, uh, especially during forest succession, diet and food choice, migration ecology, and resource selection, including selection of habitats and, and other kinds of resources um, in birds. Um, so a lot of our work 
revolves around neotropical migratory songbirds, and that's what I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about tonight. Um, these are birds that spend their summers at northern latitudes like New Jersey and then travel to um, travel to the neotropics or New World tropics to spend their winters. Um, so it's fair to think of neotropical migrants as tropical birds, since they spend the majority of the year in the neotropics. Um, but in spring, around this time, literally billions, billions of these birds make a mass exodus from the tropics into North America. Um, they pass through a multitude of countries, they hop islands, follow coastlines, follow mountain ranges, um, all the way back to their breeding grounds. Um, it's a really incredible phenomenon and, and the fidelity with which they return to these sites is truly remarkable. Um, so the reason this talk is especially timely is because migration is happening right now. And some of our first neotropical migrants are already starting to arrive in New Jersey. Uh, just the other day, I, I heard my first black and white warbler and oven bird and Louisiana water thrush. So this is a very exciting time of year to be out birding. Um, so, so then after, you know, these birds are just arriving now, but after just a few months, very short but prolific breeding season here in North America, they suddenly flow south again. They disappear in the fall and spend their winters in the tropics. Uh, so this is an animated time series model. Uh, this was created by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, using data from user submitted bird checklists. If any of you have used eBird, you're familiar with how this works, how this reporting system works. These are the annual movements of magnolia warblers as modeled by this eBird data. Um, so you can see how these birds in the spring, they just burst out of the tropics. They rush up to the boreal forests where they breed um, in the, the Northeast and the Midwest. And then, and then just as quickly as they came, they retreat back southward to the tropics. Uh, before the winter sets in. So it's absolutely remarkable movement for a bird that only weighs nine or 10 grams, right? Like, you know, about the same weight as a Sharpie marker for reference. Uh, so here in New Jersey, we only see magnolia warblers for a brief period in the spring and again in the fall, just during their migrations. Uh, but understanding how your location and the time of year fit into this bigger picture um, is one of the great and exciting pleasures about birding. Um, it's a really wonderful thing. Uh, these amazing migrations of thousands of miles are guided by, by instinct, um, by the stars, the Earth's magnetic fields, features of the landscape, and the bird's memories. Um, and uh, the really important thing to keep in mind here is that, that birds require habitat, not just where we see them, like here in New Jersey, but every place across this enormous range that they have to migrate through and stop over, or spend their winters and summers. Okay, so that makes bird conservation um, a, a very challenging hurdle. Uh, migration's a really dangerous game. Um, the birds, as I mentioned, have to travel thousands of miles. They cross oceans, weather storms. Uh, they have to avoid predators on the way, and they have to find high quality stopover habitats along the way um, to be able to fuel these migrations. Um, while flying over the ocean and over large bodies of water like the Great Lakes, they risk being blown out uh, over open water or, or becoming disoriented. And if that happens uh, with nowhere to land, they drown. Um, so the picture above uh, is a really remarkable thing that happens occasionally. This was taken at a lighthouse on a small island in Maine. Um, uh, this happened during a migration fallout where you know, millions of migrating birds had been blown out to sea over the Atlantic during a, a sudden storm. And thousands of exhausted warblers, thrushes, tanagers, orioles, you know, all the rest, they landed at the first opportunity that they could so that they could rest and wait out the storm. So that's what we're seeing here at this lighthouse. So it just illustrates the perils of, of migration. Uh, most of these birds migrate under the cover of darkness, right? Right in the dead of night. Um, maybe to keep cool, maybe so they can use the stars to navigate, uh, maybe to take advantage of the calmer air, uh, maybe to avoid predators, maybe some combination of these variables. Um, but even with their honed instincts, these, these, you know, billions of these birds each year do not survive the journey. 
Okay, only about 20% of hatchling birds even survive their first year. And adults, given survival in their first year, they only have a 50% chance of survival after that. Okay, typically, uh, given survival in their first year, songbirds only survive to three to five years, typically. Um, so this pales in comparison to their tropical counterparts, right, which routinely make it to 10 or 15 years. Um, why? It's because migration is so dangerous. You know, so, so why this strategy then? Why this, why this lifestyle if it's so perilous? Um, it's because it's worth it. Uh, migratory birds have much higher reproduction rates than their tropical colleagues. Um, because the temperate season is a boom and bust cycle when it comes to resources, um, it can't sustain dense populations of competitors or, or predators year round. Right, so the sudden abundance of insects and other prey in the spring, the low competition and the relatively uh, low density of predators, that allows migratory birds to enjoy tremendous success in producing young. Okay, so whereas a tropical thrush is lucky to produce two or three surviving offspring in a season, a wood thrush, a really productive one, uh, can produce eight or 10 surviving offspring in a season. Okay, so they're trading lower survival for higher reproduction and it's a survival strategy that, that works. Unfortunately, uh, these migratory birds, which already face really great survival challenges, uh, they're under more intense pressure than, than many of them can cope with, um, an unsustainable amount of pressure. We've lost billions of birds from North America in the past half century, uh, with some of the worst declines happening at the higher latitudes. Um, for example, more than half of the species that live in our eastern forests, uh, the most common ecosystem around here, are declining. Um, why is this happening? Um, there are a bunch of reasons. Okay, so while these declines are, are far from completely understood, we do have a pretty good idea um, of at least where some of these pressures are coming from. Um, so the data in this chart show some of the direct anthropogenic threats to North, North American birds. So these are direct threats, so it does not include indirect effects due to things like climate change and habitat loss uh, and habitat degradation, which are probably among the worst of these offenders. So something that's, um, that really stands out here is that outdoor cats, which are an invasive, invasive species here in North America, by the way, brought here by humans, they kill two and a half billion birds in North America alone each year. Okay, so um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about cats because that was a, a, a very um, obvious point of interest the last time that I gave a version of this talk. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about cats. So cats are subsidized predators. Okay, that means their populations are artificially inflated uh, by the presence of human resources. Okay, so their populations can, can reach levels that are, that are obscenely higher than populations of any other predator that would in a natural ecosystem. Okay, and, and that artificial inflation of the predator density means that birds can't cope just based on predation rates alone. Okay, so um, after the talk that I gave a couple of months ago, which was a version of this talk, we got a few email messages and Facebook messages from people who um, thought I was taking an unnecessarily strong stance against, uh, against the feral cat problem. Um, you know, and, and one of the, um, you know, there, there were a lot of comments that followed similar themes. Um, one version of this was like, I think some other reason is the real cause for bird declines. It can't be cats, right? So, so um, that the implication there is that just because other declines might be as bad, um, you know, why pick on cats? Well, even if the other declines or other reasons for decline were as bad as cats, it's still worth addressing the cat problem. That doesn't negate the cat problem. Okay. Second, and this is probably the most common um, argument that we get, is that uh, predation by cats is just nature following its course. Um, so the next two slides I put in here to kind of refute that argument, this is, uh, this is, this is new just for you. Okay, so um, cats are an introduced predator, right? They're, they're pretty close to, to at the apex of their, of their um, 
their trophic systems. Uh, they originate from a different species of Felis sylvestris uh, coming from Northern Africa and, and um, Southern Palearctic. Um, under natural conditions, um, Felis sylvestris, like, like most species of felines in the wild, occur at very, very low densities. Okay, that is typical of cats, of wild cats. Um, typically fewer than five cats per square kilometer. That's a, that's a pretty low density. Um, but even so, here in North America, our native felids, bobcats, lynx, cougars, they occur at even lower densities. These, these are our only naturally occurring felines in North America, even fewer than five cats per square kilometer. Okay, now let's translate this to um, a subsidized population of Felis sylvestris, like feral cats uh, in, in um, uh, situations like um, suburban and urban development. Okay, the density um, of cats because they're subsidized with food resources from people and from uh, uh, resources like shelter that occur near human populations, they're able to attain unnaturally high population densities, often higher than 250 cats per square kilometer, and sometimes as high as 2,000 in urban environments. And with with every one of these additional cats in that area comes an increase in the probability that a bird living in that area will be caught and killed by one. Okay, that's just a simple fact of community dynamics. Okay, um, so when we hear the argument that, that predation isn't just a normal part of nature, uh, that this is natural, um, and how we need to reevaluate our position on feral cats in relation to our native and struggling songbirds, this is the point that I wanna get across most, that this is not a natural predator this is something that we introduced and this is an impact that we are responsible for. Okay, so I think that it follows that we should be responsible for um, addressing this and protecting our birds from this threat that we created. Okay, that is, that is my view on the cat issue, which is um, the worst of the indirect anthropogenic impacts on our native bird life. Okay, so Wild Bird Research Group is doing its part to understand how populations of these neotropical migrants are um, faring locally. So um, for example, at the Fiddler's Creek Preserve Banding Station, where these photographs were taken, um, this is a joint project between Wild Bird Research Group and the Mercer County Park Commission. Um, we're studying how the, the populations of neotropical migrants are changing as the habitat succeeds from farmland to forest. This site used to be um, a degraded farmland that had been farmed for many, many years, suffering from soil compaction and degradation. Um, but uh, with lots of help from many supporters and partners and, and a little bit of time, this habitat is returning to a, um, a forest, albeit slowly. Right now it's progressing through some early successional forest stages and it's supporting a lot of important bird species of conservation concern um, along the way. So that's a really exciting project that um, we're very proud of. Uh, another one that we recently started is a new research project looking at how fruit abundance and availability change as forests get older and, and, and as the forests become more and more invaded by non-native species, which is a ubiquitous problem here in the, in the Northern Piedmont where the Sourlands is located. Um, and then how this interaction might impact the quality of those habitats for migrating birds. Okay, so this study is being conducted at the Featherbed Lane bird banding station in the Sourlands uh, with one of our long-term term mentors, Hannah Southers. Okay, so Hannah's been studying birds in the Sourlands for many decades, um, and she and several others have documented the, uh, the importance um, of the Sourlands as a haven for breeding and migrating songbirds um, here within central New Jersey. Okay, so this is a fun project that um, we started recently and we're excited to see how it progresses. Because North America has a relatively large amount of researchers and financial resources, the causes and consequences of songbird declines in North America are, are better understood here now uh, than ever before. Uh, there's still a lot to learn, but uh, we have a lot of locations for which there are long-term population monitoring data all across North America. However, some of the greatest threats to these neotropical migrants are actually happening when they're outside of our borders on their wintering grounds. Okay, this is where the human footprint is increasing the fastest 
and the human causes of bird decline are, are more directly affecting their populations. Uh, the Institute for Bird Populations, um, based in Point Reyes, California, in 2002, they initiated a, a really great project to combat this lack of information and data deficiency by starting the MOSI program. Uh, this is an acronym that stands for Monitoreo de Sobrevivencia Invernal, which just means uh, monitoring winter survivorship. It's the equivalent to their MAPS or Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship um, project, which they administer here in North America. The MOSI program uses data that are contributed from stations that are all over the New World tropics. Um, and they're looking for population changes um, to see how they relate to environmental variables like land use change, climate change, and habitat loss. Okay. So since 2011, WBRG has been participating in this MOSI program. We travel to Costa Rica and we operate um, some long-term monitoring stations there. Okay, so uh, for the last 10 years, we've been tra traveling to the Nicoya Peninsula of Northwestern Costa Rica to operate these three banding stations on the East Coast of this peninsula. Um, it's a really great area with a really high density of neotropical migrants that spend the winter there, particularly in the coastal habitats, which is where we um, do our banding. Okay, so these stations include uh, coastal mangrove forests like the one pictured here. This is at one of our stations at uh, the Karoo Wildlife Refuge. Uh, second growth scrub recovering from from former deforestation. Um, this is a really common habitat, um, especially now because there are a lot of, there, um, there are and have been historically lots of pressures in coastal forests of this area for clearing land for shrimp farming, charcoal production and agriculture. Um, so uh, when forest is, uh, when, when those areas are left to regrow, this is the kind of habitat that they progress through. So understanding the importance of this habitat to our wintering neotropical migrants is a pretty critical thing. And our third station is at the Cabo Blanco Absolute Nature Reserve. Uh, this was Costa Rica's first national park. Um, and it's really a privilege to get to work here. The forest is only about 60 years old, um, but it, it looks extremely lush. The trees are enormous and uh, it's, it's almost hard to tell. Um, one of the telltale signs though, is that everything is covered in vines. Um, that is a characteristic of young forests in the tropics is that everything's draped with vines. So these studies um, rely largely on data from bird banding, uh, capturing birds using mist nets um, and marking them with uniquely numbered leg bands. Uh, bird banding is a highly regulated activity. And in Costa Rica, you need permits from both the Costa Rican government um, to ban the resident species and from the US government to ban the neotropical migrants. Every band number um, on these birds' legs, that's associated with a set of measurements. Um, uh, the date and time of capture, wing length, tail length, fat score, we can actually tell how well the bird's been eating based on the amount of subcutaneous fat that it's carrying, which you can see just by parting the bird's feathers, um, the mass of the bird, its age, its sex, and uh, you can calculate some body condition indices to further try to figure out how well they've been eating and how healthy they are. If any of those birds are recaptured again by us or anyone else, it's easy to look up the band number to see when and where it was first banded. And in this way, the life histories of these birds can be pieced together. Okay, so being able to recognize an individual bird by the band number when it's captured multiple times allows us to study uh, some really important aspects of um, the ecology of these migratory birds. Demography, survivorship, health and condition and trends therein, longevity, site fidelity, you know, the rate at which birds return to the same sites over and over again, and um, to a lesser extent, their migration routes. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit, the connection between bird banding and migration research. Okay, um, so we catch, oh dear, uh, let me get back to that slide. Things were going so smoothly. 
get to see the cat figure again. Okay, so uh, we get to catch and ban some really cool resident species like this long-tailed mannequin. We absolutely love these things. They get to be really old, as a matter of fact. Um, these birds can make it to 20 years um, in the wild. Uh, this black-headed trogon, this is a male, beautiful iridescent back plumage. This barred ant shrike, um, you may be familiar with some of the ant following birds in the tropics. Um, there's a whole set of birds that make it their living to follow army ants. And army ants are a species of ant that, that forms these swarms each day. And these big swarms of ants move through the forest. And the ants themselves aren't very palatable, but this swarm of ants moving through the forest, it it startles and, and um, activates enough insects and, uh, and invertebrates and, and small vertebrates like, like lizards and salamanders and things. It forces them to move and become more conspicuous and it makes them easy prey for these ant following birds. So the barred ant shrike is one of these uh, birds that likes to follow army ants. Um, this is the American pygmy kingfisher. This is the smallest kingfisher in the Americas. They only weigh about the same as a warbler. This is one of our mangrove forest specialists. This turquoise browed motmot, this happens to be the national bird of Nicaragua. They're really stunning birds. This blue throated sapphire, um, also called the blue throated golden tail, really wonderful hummingbird species that's only about the size of our ruby throated hummingbird. And this is a male, the females have more subdued blue in the gorget and the, the bill is less red. Hummingbird banding is um, actually a focus of ours at WBRG. So um, this, uh, this feeding station here at um, our home base at Finca Pora Vida, this started as an effort to understand the migration and site fidelity in ruby-throated hummingbirds, which come to these feeders quite a bit. But um, since then, it's expanded to include all of the dozen species that visit the feeders. Um, so uh, we maintain an array of 15 hummingbird feeders, which we have to keep filled constantly. Um, and we're visited by literally thousands of hummingbirds each day. And um, they drink a tremendous amount of nectar, um, something like three to five gallons each day is typical during the busiest seasons, um, especially when uh, green breasted mangoes, our most abundant species, are migrating through the area. So these, these feeders get very busy with hummingbirds. And many of those are our migratory ruby throated hummingbirds. And so this is an opportunity for us to band and study them during the winter. Um, so as you can imagine, banding hummingbirds is um, even fiddlier than banding songbirds. Their legs are thinner than a toothpick and they require a whole set of special equipment and tiny bands. And um, it's a very specialized and very finicky process. Okay, so uh, notwithstanding what a privilege it is to work with these amazing neotropical resident species, the reason we're in Costa Rica in the first place is to study the, um, the wintering population of neotropical migrants, okay? Um, and so this slide just shows a few of the familiar faces that we see each, each year when we go to Costa Rica. You know, we have our chestnut-sided warbler, our hooded warbler, worm-eating warbler, American red start, black and white warbler, the list goes on. Um, that set of neotropical migrants that we banned in Costa Rica also includes some of the less familiar species like this painted bunting, um, really wonderful birds um, that we catch not, not too frequently, but, but regularly. Um, a really tragic thing is that some of these really colorful migrants are popular cage birds um, in Central and South America, um, where they're captured during the winter and during their migrations and they're sold in the illegal pet trade. Um, but at any rate, um, neotropical migrants represent a significant proportion of the bird population in the tropics um, when they're in town, so to speak, during the winter. Uh, the region where we study on the east edge of the Nicoya Peninsula in northwestern Costa Rica 
that's a tropical humid forest kind of bordering on deciduous dry forest. And the abundance of neotropical migrants in that habitat is really high. Uh, more than one in four of the birds that we catch are neotropical migrants. Uh, some of the common species in this region <clears throat> are very familiar to us denizens of the Sourlands and surrounding area, especially if we bird forested habitats. Um, some of the quintessential Sourlands birds um, like Kentucky warbler here, black and white warbler, oven bird, wood thrush, um, and others not pictured like hooded warbler, worm eating warbler, um, great crested flycatcher. These are regular members of the Costa Rica bird community. Uh, which is a pretty interesting thing to think about them. You know, we, we're most familiar with them in the context of the forests where we live and where we bird, but removing them from that context text and placing them in a tropical one is just a really interesting thing to contemplate. Um, over the years of this study, we've had many, many recaptures of birds that return to the same wintering grounds year after year. Okay, this phenomenon is called site fidelity, and it's a fascinating thing. Not only do these birds return to the same summer territories year after year, but they do the same thing on the wintering grounds. Okay, uh, And as it turns out, 13% of the neotropical migrants that we banned return to our banding stations in subsequent years. Okay, So given the high mortality of these birds, uh, that 13% probably represents a really large portion of, this, of the annual surviving population that returns year after year. Okay. Um, this site fidelity means we can track the fates of individual birds um, at these sites with relative ease too. Um, but because of the low recapture rates between stations, um, bird banding is not always as helpful in learning about migrations of individual birds as it is studying the fates of individual birds within a specific site, if that makes sense. Okay, this is why the era that we live in is really exciting, um, because we've moved past bird banding and the technological advancements that are being made now uh, make it possible to track the precise movements and migration routes of individual birds. And from that, we can derive information about whole populations of birds. Uh, so we use miniaturized GPS transmitters to study winter movements and migrations of owls, like this threatened long-eared owl pictured here. Um, I actually have one of the GPS transmitters here, um, very, very small units. And these can record many, many points in a single day and transmit it via satellite. So um, once it's deployed on a bird, we just sit back and can download the data um, by logging online to the satellite servers. Okay, and right now, as we speak, we have several long-eared owls wearing this type of GPS transmitter uh, that we can monitor remotely. Um, other transmitters we use have to be visited periodically to have their data downloaded, but uh, these, these, it's not the case for these transmitters. So this map shows the progress of two of those GPS tagged owls. Uh, these owls are still actively migrating, um, and uh, these most recent locations shown on this map, these are from yesterday afternoon when I just downloaded this data. Um, so both of these birds right now are on the east edge of the Adirondacks, and they're on their way to who knows where. You know, we, uh, nobody's ever been able to study the migrations of long-eared owls with this level of detail before, so um, where these birds Hail from is an open mystery, one that hopefully we can close after a few years of this type of research. But others have begun to use similar technology on songbirds. So while these GPS units that I just described and just showed you, they're too heavy for these tiny birds weighing eight or nine grams, like these warblers shown, but two major innovations have allowed us to track the migrations of, of these individual warblers. One of those innovations is light level geolocators. These units, um, they use ambient light, very clever units, ambient light to determine the sunrise and sunset times at a bird's location, as well as the length of day. Okay, so those units store those data, and if you're able to recover the unit and download the data that had been logged over the course of that tag's deployment, uh, then the latitude can be derived uh, from the day length and the longitude derived from the sunrise and sunset times which gives you approximate coordinates throughout that period, okay? So it's a very simple 
um, uh, concept um, and these miniaturized units um, make it practicable in birds. Okay, uh, but the middle bird is wearing a different type of technology. Uh, this is called a nanotag. Okay, uh, the nanotag emits a VHF signal um, that, that can be picked up at receiving stations that are permanent set up. Um, they've been built all along the Eastern US. So if this bird with an, wearing a nanotag flies within range of one of these stations, any one of these stations, the researcher will find out about it. Okay, this is, the, this is um, called the MODIS network. Um, so we're actually collaborating with the state of North Carolina right now to build a series of MODIS towers down there. Um, they call this series of towers a, a fence. And we're trying to get a fence built across the Southern Appalachians, which right now is a blind spot in the national MODIS grid. So hopefully this will help us track some of our neotropical migrants wearing nanotags as they use the um, Appalachian flyway um, on their migrations north and south. Okay, so using these technologies, um, some really exciting research has been published just in the past few years. Okay, this is really cutting edge stuff and a lot of the data is still rolling in. Um, so this prothonotary warbler, not the one in the photo on the left, that's a photo that I took in Costa Rica, but um, it's representative, it's just a representative, a stand-in. So the prothonotary warbler um, that the figure on the right refers to, this was originally banded and um, fixed with a, a geolocator on the summer grounds in July. Um, over about three months, it traveled to Mexico um, and the Yucatan um, and then to its wintering grounds in Colombia. And then during its spring migration on its return journey, it followed a different path traveling through Central America and then it crossed the Gulf of Mexico back to its starting point where they recaptured the bird and recovered this data. Um, interesting to note, the return journey only took about three weeks, whereas the southbound journey took about three months. So that's, that's an interesting thing. Okay, this wood thrush was followed for two years and it took different migration routes as well. Um, uh, during its first southbound migration in this study, it followed pretty tightly followed the east coast um, before going across the Caribbean, but then for subsequent migrations, it, it crossed the Gulf of Mexico and took an inland route um, to get back to its um, breeding grounds. And some species like Swainson's thrushes are revealing some really interesting things. Uh, they've been found to use very different migrations depending upon the region and the subspecies of Swainson's thrush that you're studying. So with birds that are banded the farthest north traveling uh, the longest distances to spend the winter. So this is really exciting stuff and it's the first time uh, that, that this information has been um, uh, discoverable. So it's a very exciting time to be an ornithologist studying our neotropical migrants. Okay, so uh, these long distance migrations that traverse entire continents um, and many countries, they highlight what's probably the most important takeaway of the talk tonight. Um, and that's that uh, saving migratory birds has to be a multinational effort and responsibility. It's not something that one nation can take on on its own. Uh, more than 30 countries in the Americas host neotropical migrants for part of the year, okay? And um, the USA has been a leader in migratory bird conservation since the uh, early 20th century, okay? But there have been recent terrible efforts to undermine these protections and jeopardize this legacy, okay? Um, so the flagship legislation um, that I mentioned earlier in this talk, um, protecting migratory birds in the Americas was the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1916, and then the subsequent Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, I'm sorry, the Migratory Bird Treaty of 1916, followed by the Bird Treaty Act of 1918. Okay, so um, uh, these two pieces of legislation recently celebrated their centennials um, in 2016 and 2018, respectively, um, the treaty and then the Treaty Act. So what does this act actually do? Um, you know, we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but um, yeah, first I wanna contextualize the, uh, this legislation with, with some history surrounding it and what what caused it to come into being? You know, what motivated this? So 
So since the American Revolution, um, regulation of wildlife, including in hunting and selling of birds, that had been left to each of the individual states. There were no protections for birds um, or wildlife in general at the federal level. Okay, so um, an important challenge to that convention though, it happened in 1896 with this Gear versus Connecticut case, which had, um, had to do with hunting and transporting birds for market. Okay, it was a market hunting controversy. A district court ruled that regulating another state's ability to hunt or transport wildlife, regulating that would be unconstitutional at the federal level. So there was no change in the precedent that states got to regulate their own bird life at that point. But nonetheless, it was obvious that something had to be done because unchecked market hunting was absolutely decimating wild bird populations at this time. Okay, and it was a very well-known phenomenon and well-documented. Okay, so in the early 1800s and early, sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, conservationists were panicking, okay, because certain groups of birds were, were decreasing and dwindling right before their eyes, okay, and many of these people had seen the firsthand um, the extinctions of some very charismatic bird species like the passenger pigeon, uh, the heath hen, great auk, um, the ivory-billed woodpecker, and the Labrador duck. And many of these declines and extinctions, they were being caused by unchecked market hunting. Okay, and despite outcry from certain sectors of the public, at the end of the 19th century, uh, market hunting was actually accelerating despite that outcry. Um, and that was caused largely by a growing fashion trend of using bird feathers in ladies' hats, uh, which is a, a very, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sure many of you have, have heard about that phenomenon in that history. Um, egrets, herons, spoonbills, um, ibises, other water birds, they were disappearing right before their eyes. Um, some states enacted protections within their borders, but as we discussed, borders don't contain these migratory birds. Okay, so as long as other states um, that were neighboring were allowing this unchecked hunting, it wasn't enough to simply regulate hunting um, within one state's borders. Okay, so in response to the alarming loss of birds, um, Congress passed the Weeks McLean Migratory Bird Act in 1913. That, um, that same year, the Supreme Court ruled that the act was unconstitutional since it took rights that were warranted to states to regulate their, their, um, their own wildlife and it took those rights away. Uh, but then um, in 1916, uh, Congress passed a pretty groundbreaking decision uh, they passed the Migratory Bird Treaty between the U.S. and Great, Bit Great Britain on behalf of Canada at that time. Um, so the key point and key difference here between the Migratory Bird Treaty and the weeks mclean Migratory Bird Act, which failed, is that federal treaty power supersedes state rights to regulate their own wildlife, and it forces states to comply with the treaty. Okay, so after that, additional treaties were signed with Mexico and then symbolically with Japan and Russia, even though we don't share any migratory birds with those countries. Um, the new um, treaty and act, they were quickly contested. Um, Missouri sued to remove the restrictions on its right to set rules managing its own bird life, arguing that they were unconstitutional. Um, but this was really crucial. The Supreme Court upheld the new act because federal, again, federal treaty power took precedence over state laws. Okay, so the act was upheld. And that really set a precedence for future legislation and, um, and legal battles as well, because they've continued to uphold the act. Okay, so the act itself, um, it regulates certain hunting techniques like baiting. So, so it reduces those kinds of things and restricts those. Um, it currently prote protects over a thousand species of migratory birds. The exact number changes upon review every few years, um, but the act makes it um, unlawful to pursue, hunt, take. This is, I bolded this because this is an important concept here coming up. Capture or kill any migratory bird or part nest or egg thereof. Okay. And until 2021, take had been interpreted to include any actions that kill birds, whether they were incidental or known. Okay, um, so that's really key here. 
So the concept of um, incidental take um, uh, is really important. So because of incidental take prohibitions uh, in the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, companies were held responsible for any bird deaths that were caused by their operations. In order to avoid liability, companies had to ensure that incidental deaths um, caused by their operations were minimized. And the kinds of actions they would have to take to minimize incidental bird deaths included uh, preliminary surveys, environmental impact assessments and reports. Uh, they would have to take preventative action to try to avoid bird deaths, um, proposed changes, um, uh, to their permits and their applications that would, would try to limit bird deaths. Um, and then they would also be forced to mitigate um, if they did cause bird deaths. And, and so um, this was a really important interpretation of the Migratory Bird Act that has um, done a decent job of protecting birds um, when these conflicts arise. Um, so early in their term, the outgoing presidential administration announced that it would it wanted to dissolve the prohibitions against incidental take. It said that that was um, an overreach of the federal government and incidental take had been interpreted uh, too loosely. Um, and it took nearly the entire term for those changes to be solidified. Um, but uh, uh, early this year in um, in late January, it was announced that the changes were finally finalized, that incidental take was no longer going to uh, be punishable under the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So under the new interpretation, companies would no longer be held responsible for deaths of birds caused by their operations as long as the killing of the birds is not what they actually set out to do. Okay, so um, that essentially guts the Migratory Bird Treaty Act um, and de-incentivizes companies and corporations to ensure that their activities minimize or prevent bird deaths. Um, I have just a few examples of incidental take that were previously considered in violation of the act, um, but companies were um, no longer responsible for under this new interpretation. Uh, one of these was uh, bird deaths caused by open exposed oil reserve pits. That's what's pictured here. This is where, um, you know, water is pumped into and out of the ground during uh, oil and, and gas drilling and where this water is stored. Um, the, the retention pits often contain surfactants and oil slick. Uh, so when birds like waterfowl and other water birds, um, particularly while migrating, they think that these are just normal ponds or lakes, they land, they can, um, you know, uh, their feathers can be oiled. If they um, ingest any of this water, they can be poisoned. So many birds died as a result of poisoning or drowning in oil reserve pits and, and um, you know, preventative action and mitigation was um, required by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because that would have been cons considered incidental take. Another was electrocution. Uh, when large birds perch on utility poles or wires, if they manage to contact two of the wrong points on the live wires, they can become electrocuted. That was an example of incidental take. Another was destruction of habitat during the active nesting season. So previously companies and corporations would be required to perform surveys, avoid active nests or delay habitat disturbance until after the breeding season when they could uh, demonstrate that no more birds were actively nesting on site, lest they be in violation of um, the incidental take prohibitions. So the habitat still gets destroyed either way, but delaying until after nesting helps to ensure that the birds themselves, those individual birds, have a chance to survive the, the bulldozers. And this is a more controversial one, um, deaths due to window collisions, which account for upwards of a billion bird deaths each year. Um, this was contentious even under the old interpretation of the act and developers were rarely held to account for deaths caused by building and window designs um, that didn't consider bird mortalities. But this is a major problem to migrating birds. But probably the most egregious examples to contemplate are major environmental catastrophes caused by um, companies. So the 2010 Deepwater Horizon spill 
was one such catastrophe. Um, in this event, 5 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf of Mexico and absolutely devastated its marine and coastal ecosystems. Uh, more than a million birds died um, as a result of this spill. And just to give you a sense of the scale of this problem, um, they were able to detect trace amounts of chemicals that were linked to this spill um, in tissues of migratory birds as far away as Minnesota. Okay, so this was a very far reaching um, catastrophe. Because they were held liable for the incidental take of these birds, uh, BP was forced to pay 100 million um, for their hand in this disaster. Um, the fines for the Migratory Bird Treaty Act violations represented less than 1% of BP's overall settlement, but they were and still are being used to help restore impacted habitats in the Gulf and to bring back the birds that were lost um, during that event. Okay. Uh, so the idea that a company would not have been fined for the direct damage caused to bird populations if this kind of disaster happened again is frankly outrageous. Um, these birds and our nation's legacy of bird uh, uh, conservation deserve way better. Um, so the last time that I gave this talk, uh, the previous administration's rule change exempting uh, regulated agents from, from incidental take had been finalized that same week that I gave that talk. So that was a very bleak time for migratory birds. But I'm very pleased to be able to say now that the last administration's final rule solidifying that new interpretation is on its last legs. Uh, the current administration's Department of the Interior recently rescinded that previous interpretation and froze the rec recent changes from taking effect pending a review. Um, so the fate of the, the previous administration's final rule is still uncertain, but um, uh, it seems very likely that it will be thrown out. Uh, restoring the original interpretation of the act to include incidental take. Okay, so um, this restoration of the act and its key provisions will take time. I'm told maybe more than a year, but this was a big step for migratory bird conservation um, in North America. Uh, so things are looking a lot better than they were a few months ago for migratory birds. Uh, the timing of this talk couldn't have been much better. Uh, it's Earth Day, and right around this time every year, Earth Day is a really good benchmark. Uh, the floodgates are opening, okay, and our migratory birds are returning. Uh, the woods are coming alive with, with sounds of all kinds of birds. Just yesterday, I heard my first black and white warbler and Louisiana water thrush. Um, two days ago, I had my first oven bird. Um, so this is a really exciting time. And um, we're lucky to live in an area that places a lot of value um, on the integrity of our natural lands and, and these incredible birds um, and the other organisms that, that co-occur with these birds. Um, and the Sourlands region protects the greatest density of breeding neotropical migrants in central New Jersey. And that's a really great thing. Um, and while the Sourlands region isn't without its threats and pressures, uh, you can go out into its many preserves and, and see a lot of these incredible birds there yourself. Um, when I last gave this talk, these migrants were hundreds of miles away, um, spending their winter among the toucanets and harpy eagles and quetzals, ocelots, tapers. And um, while they're gone, we, we do miss them. Um, but we're finally rounding the bend this spring. It's my favorite time of year. The birds are returning um, and they're carrying out this, this same ancestral migrations that they've done for millions and millions of years before us. Um, and it's just such a wonderful time of year. Uh, to be paying attention to birds and um, and finally getting to see them again. So I want to thank you for your attention and and say that if you have any questions about our research, about birds in general, whether of the Sourlands or Costa Rica, about the laws protecting them, I'd be happy to try to answer them. So uh, thank you for listening. Tyler, that was amazing. That's so much information and your 